Hello, Philadelphia, South Jersey, and all you wonderful people in Internet land. This is the Joe Cook Program, and I am your host, Joe Cook, hence the name of the show. My guest today is Mike Nelson. Mike is best known as the host of the cult classic television series Mystery Science Theater 3000, where he and his robot pals, Tom Servo and Crow, were trapped in outer space and forced to watch really bad movies. To pass the time, they'd make fun of him. Well, he's at it again, adding commentary tracks to DVDs for legend films, and he's launched a new website, RiffTracks.com, where you can download MP3s of Mike making fun of the more mainstream bad movies he wasn't able to riff on Mystery Science Theater. All you've got to do is play the MP3 along with the DVD, and you're set. Hey, Mike, thanks for taking the time to be on the show today. It is my pleasure, Joe. Thanks. So... Was there any point in your childhood where you said to yourself, uh, when I grow up, I want to hang out with puppets and watch bad movies? <laughs> it, doesn't every child dream of that? <laughs> uh, no, it was, you know, it was something of a surprise. I kind of figured, since there was no other discernible talents, I would be involved in comedy somehow. So uh, that part wasn't a surprise. But, uh, yeah, as I always said, it was a, a little weird to, to be uh, famous for staring at plastic puppets <laughs> and gumball machines yeah so how did you first become involved with uh, mst3k uh i was doing stand-up comedy in the minneapolis area and uh i met all the guys who were involved with the show just kind of various stages that we'd all play on and i became pretty good friends with josh weinstein who was uh on the uh, uh was better acquainted with joel hodgson who was the original host of the show and uh, they were pretty good friends. So they, the show kind of formed uh, around this small TV station. They did some shows locally, and then they sold it to Comedy Central and said, uh, you know, would you like to come aboard and do some typing? And I said, yeah, it sounds better than working at Friday. So that's kind of <laughs> how I got involved. Now, your main role for the first five seasons was as the writer, right? That's right, yeah. And I would play some whenever we needed to... Uh, have some uh, buddy dress in humiliating clothes and play some character, I would also do that. Uh, who were some of your favorite characters that you got to play in the Joel years? Uh, I think Mothra was one of my favorites. <laughs> uh, and then I played uh, Michael Feinstein, which uh, people seem to enjoy that one. I still have. Uh, and I think he, I heard that he enjoyed it, so that made me happy. <laughs> so how was it decided that you would be the new host after Joel left? Uh, well, I was already there. That makes it simple. Um, but actually, they, they auditioned other people, and uh, I think, you know, the other writers were kind of pulling for me, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I knew the show so well, and so it just, it, you know, it was kind of, uh, it was sort of natural. So, you know, I know that you uh, you still uh, do stuff with Kevin Murphy and, uh, and with Bill. Do you... Um, do you still keep in touch with any of the people from the early years? Um, you know, I saw I saw Trace not too long ago, and uh, every now and then I talk to Frank. Frank's uh, he, he he's bouncing around the country, so I haven't seen him in a little while. But uh, if I'm, uh, I think I've seen him out in L.A. But I keep in touch with those people less. I think they just they moved out uh, to L.A. and it was just a little harder. So, uh, but yeah, you know, Kevin and and uh, and Bill were living right around me, so uh, it was uh, much easier to keep in touch with them. And Mary Jo Peel, too, I see quite a bit. Now, now you stepped in during the fifth season, and, uh, you know, the argument's been going on forever, so l let me ask you, Joel or Mike? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think definitely you got to go with Joel. If you find him on DVD, that Mike guy, <laughs> he, he ruined the show. <laughs> the Jump the Shark? Yeah, totally. <laughs> so, how did um how did MST3K the movie come come about? Uh, you know, we started shopping around the idea to just do a feature film of it. It was kind of uh, you know, it was always a, a cult show, but there was always a sense like, oh, this could really go to the next level. So, we kind of fly out to LA and meet with various studios and then, you know, somebody'd say yes and then they'd get fired and or they'd move to some other studio and first it was going to be a big multi-million dollar project and then it was going to be a small film and so it just was a process of years of kind of all different talks about it and uh finally uh there was someone at universal who just said you know i i get it i i think it's funny so just let's go ahead and make it and uh 
I wish it were that easy. It ended up not to be. But uh, now, I guess that was my next question: was how was that experience compared to uh, you're doing a regular episode? Uh, it was hell, frankly. Really? <laughs> you know, it's just with the TV show. It was we had it all figured out. It was uh, you know the system was down. We were cooking along. We really enjoyed the work. We we cared a lot about it. And and when the movie came along, they kind of when they pull that control from out of your hands, you don't realize, you know, and they sort of slowly, they say they want you to do, you know, we just want you to do what you do best, but they don't really mean it. And then, uh, and they slowly kind of take that, the power to control your own thing away from you. And then you suddenly, you know, you realize, man, this is just, uh, it's, it's really hard. So it was a difficult process. So, um, where was where was it filmed? Was it filmed at the same set or in in California? No, we actually filmed part of it in uh, uh, Prince's Purple Rain Studio, <laughs> whatever the whatever the hell he called Paisley Park. That's it, <laughs> and uh, and part of it was just at a, a studio in St. Paul. No, oh, no kidding. Well, I actually saw it in the theater. It actually it came to my local theater for a week. Wow, you were one of the twelve people who saw it then. I'm serious. Actually, and my cousin was yelling. Me and my cousin saw it. Saw it in the paper. Said, "Whoa!" We, we were blown away that it was actually at our local theater. We didn't even have to go to a big city. You and your cousin represented two sixths of the entire <laughs> audience for that film. Well, I'm honored. It actually it did it did well in the theaters it played at, but I I do think it was only out at at any given time. It was at like you know twenty theaters or something like that. So um. Tell me a little bit about Legend Films. Uh, now, you've just been named, now let me get this right, is it Chief Content Producer? <laughs> yeah, I wanted, <laughs> I wanted a name that, uh, so that everyone could just sort of point at me and go, hey, Chief. So <laughs> you just sort of pulled that one out of a hat. Uh, it's essentially doing what I've always done, which is just to uh, you know, provide content, as it were, and make silly commentaries and, and uh, continue to do what I've always done, but just kind of from from this home base, because I've done so much work for him already. It was just sort of a natural. Uh, so hence the producing content. Exactly. So uh, so you had to make the move to San Diego then for that. So uh, how's, uh, how's San Diego been treating you? Oh, it's great. You know, if you're going to move, uh, if you're going to move anywhere. I, I love Minneapolis, but, uh, you know, the winters, I used to say they keep the riffraff away. And uh, I guess I'm one of the riffraff because you start as you get older you just the winters are hard they're a little bit grinding and so this has been really nice so far and was that a was that a hard adjustment you know just you know kind of uprooting the family and everything yeah but they've taken surprisingly well to it i mean what's not to like uh, that exactly <laughs> we live close to the beach where you know the weather's nice every single day well i'll tell you i'm in jersey and i live close to the beach and it, it ain't san diego <laughs> So, uh, Got access to it. You can go <laughs> surfing in the winter with your parka on or whatever. <laughs> yeah. So how are uh, how are you adjusting to having to show back up to a to an office for work? Now you were working at home, right? I was. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I was never one of those guys who kind of shuffled around in his pajamas, and I, I kind of like to get out and about anyway. So, uh, and I actually I don't come into the office every day. It's just, Sometimes I, I will work at home, but uh, it's actually nice to have a place to go away, f you know, from because my wife wants me out of the house for <laughs> at least for a few hours every day. So it made everybody happy. Huh? I, I think everyone wins. <laughs> so most of the commentaries that you've been doing recently have been solo. How how is that compared to you know when you've got somebody else in there with you? Uh, it's a little bit different. You tailor it a little differently, but uh, it's not a great deal different. Uh, you, you can. Uh, there's obviously riffs that you can't do, you, may, you know, unless you're, you know, playing someone who's schizophrenic. You, you can't answer yourself. <laughs> but otherwise, I structure it almost the same way, and uh, uh, and it seems to work. I think people, you, you kind of get used to it. Uh, you get into the rhythm of the film, and uh, you don't notice that that uh, wow, there's a guy who's, you know, producing comments at a rate that he couldn't possibly do. But but it uh, it. It works and it seems to play really well. I mean, but that said, I, it, it's it's a lot more fun to have someone else in there and to bounce stuff off of them. And uh, but but I like you know I like both. And and writing is the key. And if you can write it well, it, it works well. Well, I I, uh, I listened to the Star Trek Five riff track uh, earlier this week, uh, watching you know watching the movie, which 
you know, I, I don't really appreciate you making me sit through that movie, but, <laughs> but, but I really, actually, you know what? It was really, really funny. It was oh, j- just as good as uh, any MST3K I've seen. And That's re- great to hear. Yeah, well, it was I know, that was a little painful with the, uh, with that movie, but it was worth it, I think, to get to uh, God beating them up. Uh, that was pretty nice. Yeah, it, it, you know, getting through the row, row, row your boat part um, <laughs> was tough, but I, I, made, it, I made it through. That explains uh, why Kevin exploded with rage at the end when they when they recapped the uh, row, row, row your boat. <laughs> I thought he was going to, you know, pop a gasket there. Yeah, that, uh, whew, that's pretty rough, but uh, but I made it through. <laughs> Yeah, good. You know what's worse is I uh, I was having a problem with uh, I was ordering it through uh, one of those uh, movie rental things that's online. Oh sure. And uh, I, actually, it's the one that's through your website, but it's just not coming to me right now. And uh, I I was having a problem with their website, and I clicked it, um, and it wouldn't go to the next page to tell me I purchased it. And I clicked it a few times. They ended up charging me four times for Star Trek Five. Oh, oh, the shame! You, you've admitted that now on oh. the air. You've You've ordered Star Trek Five four times. It's been, I know. <laughs> now, as now, I bow my head in shame. I, I just released uh, a commentary for the Britney Spears film Crossroads, <laughs> and uh, part of the secret joy I take from it is that uh, people will have to go out now to their local video stores and walk up to the counter and say, I would like to rent Crossroads, please. M- Mike, i, I got to tell you, I don't know how good your commentary's got to be for me to go out... <laughs> And pick up a copy of Crossroads. Do it online then, because <laughs> it turned out, you know, I was thinking to myself, I don't know about Crossroads, and, and there's a guy here who's a real booster of it, and he, he talked me into it, and uh, I ended up where I, I really thought it was, I think it's going to be a great one, so I hope <laughs> people follow along. and You know, rent it online, you won't have any shame that way. I'd imagine that that one had to almost write itself for you. <laughs> It was pretty sweet, yeah. Some of them, you know, it's it's it can be kind of tough, like uh, you know, an action film when it's just you know, five minutes of uh, Vin Diesel on a motorcycle, and you, you know, it's it's a challenge to write it. I, it. It's fun in the end, but just in terms of the ease of writing, when it's just a lot of goofy dialogue and a lot of stupid stuff, and and Britney Spears, then you got a lot of. It's a target rich environment. Well, I, actually, that reminds me too. I wanted to thank you for riffing Triple X because that's nine do- nine dollars and two hours of my life I can never have back. <laughs> but uh, you know, it was great hearing you and Kevin though riffing on uh, on Star Trek Five, and it, uh, I'm looking forward to Bill Corbett with you on X Men. Yeah, it's it's going to be a lot of fun. So um, that one there. Now, do you guys have any plans of getting the three of you in there? Uh, I'm sure we will at some point. Right now, it's just sort of a scheduling thing. Uh, we're all in separate parts of the country, and now Bill, he was out in L.A. for a while. He's, he's back in in uh, Minneapolis now, and I think he's going to come back out to California sort of quarter time. So there's probably going to be a time where we can all get together. Oh, very cool. Is there any particular movie that the three of you have just been waiting to tackle together? Oh, uh, I think it would be fun. I, I don't know, you know, how if we can do it, but I think it'd be fun to do something sort of epic, you know, like a Lord of the Rings or a Star Wars or Star Trek or you know, just something that uh, over the years that people have always asked us to do certain things, and and obviously we've never been able to, and this frees us up to do that. So probably something big. That would be very to... very cool. Actually, that'd be uh, that'd be really cool, and I think probably the obvious if you're going to go down the Star Trek route is Phantom Menace. But uh, yeah. can I make a few suggestions for a future riff tracks? Please. All right. Uh, all right. The first one that just comes to mind for me is the day after tomorrow. Oh, I'd love to do that. Yeah. Then I've got. Well, I mean, you've probably been swamped with, with requests for Batman and Robin. Yeah, I I don't know if you know I don't know if I can take that. <laughs> uh, Triple X is maybe your nadir. That one would be mine. You know, there was. I remember the first time I watched Batman and Robin, and I threw that tape in, and. I literally had to stop it five minutes into the movie because I just was cracking up out loud when Commissioner Gordon pops up on this Batman's video screen dressed up like Chief O'Hara from the Adam West series saying, Batman, there's a new villain in Gotham. It was just yeah, it, awful. It was painful all around. The, the, the you know, be-nippled suits and all yeah. that <laughs> too much. The Batman credit card? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that he could buy a woman. Yeah, I don't know if I could do it again. I'll I'll take a look at it though. Um 
Also, the one thing I always wondered was, how did Mr. Freeze and Poison Ivy end up in the same cell at the end of the movie? I think by that time, I had actually sliced my carotid artery and was bleeding out uh, in hopes of dying, so I don't remember that. No. Well, you, then, then you were having a better time than I was. <laughs> I think so. Uh, okay, my next one on the list is uh, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that might not be bad. Uh, as, I, as I recall, it's touch long, isn't it? Is it one of those movies that I've, I've determined that that I'm, you know, I'm getting too old to conquer these really long movies. I can't remember the time. All I really remember was the uh, annoying kid from Goonies was in it, and he should have stayed in Goonies. Yeah, yeah, short round. <laughs> I believe was his name. I believe so. And then uh, I, the last one on my list is Beneath the Planet of the Apes. That was the second one with uh, James Franciscus. Exactly. Yes, and the little uh, aliens, uh, well, not aliens, they were sort of mutant people, the right? Yeah, they worshipped the bomb. Yes. Yeah, we we did a, a pretty major takeoff of that on uh, on Mystery Science, where they, uh, there were apes and bombs, and I don't remember what our take was on it, but yeah, we <laughs> I, I'd love to do that one. Uh, do you have any plans to riff track any more like, bad old B-movies, or are you going to focus more on the uh, really bad mainstream movies? Well, I think uh, riff tracks is going to focus on... The bigger ones that I think you know people have, people seem really excited about that concept, and then uh, I think with Legend, uh, some titles that were released you know to DVD, well, they will probably tend to be uh, you know a little more along the lines of, of something we might have done on Mystery Science. Sort of like your Plan Nine and Carnival of Souls and all that. Yeah, exactly. Are there, is there anything coming up uh, coming out from Legends anytime soon? Uh, you know, I've been sort of you know just. Uh, pedal to the metal on riff tracks, and uh, I, I haven't even looked at what's coming ahead. So, uh, but it, it might be nice to uh, to do a little change of pace with a, a little less Vin Diesel and Tom Cruise. <laughs> now, I'm assuming the riffing process is a lot longer than just you know watching the movie and ad libbing. <laughs> uh, I'd imagine that the writing process is probably just about as torturous uh, as uh, Doctor Forster intended. <laughs> it, it actually is. I, I um, you know. The process probably takes, uh, oh, I, I'd probably do it over the course of, uh, you know, a work week, but uh, many times I work deep into the night because, you know, it's just, uh, you want to get it over with. It is, it's very painful. You're not watching it, uh, you know, in real time and just throwing out wisecracks and amusing your friends. You're, you're sort of saying, this has to be the, you know, hopefully the funniest thing I can say in this situation and that may not be much but it has to be the best and and that's tough you got to watch it and rewatch it and have a cup of coffee and think about it and so it takes a, a real long time so how many times did you have to sit through plan nine uh i don't know i'm sure i sit through it before i do it i sit through it three times but again each viewing is is unbelievably long <laughs> <laughs> many many hours of stopping and going back over it so um Oh, I tell you, I really enjoyed plans one through eight, and it's it's <laughs> it's, it's it's great to finally know what exactly happened. Yeah, I'm glad. that that always sort of confused me. They never really mention any of their plans. <laughs> well, did you expect Ed Wood to give you much backstory? <laughs> no, I didn't expect coherence at all. I guess. <laughs> uh, now, now, from what I've read about you, you actually seem like a pretty conservative guy, and, and I've read in interviews that you know your faith is an important part of your life. Does does that play a big influence in the work you do? Yeah, it does. I mean, I, I try to only do stuff that really is, is uh, uh, you know, hopefully can bring joy to people and, and make them laugh. And I, I try not to. Uh, there's just a lot of things that I won't do because of that and a lot of things where I sort of craft it to make sure that I don't have to compromise my what I believe in. And that's, you know, I think everybody does that to some extent, but... Uh, uh, and, and it's not it's not that tough, but it's something that you have to keep in mind because many times stuff comes up and you just go, oh, it would be easier to just compromise my mm -hmm. values and do it, and then you realize that that's you know it's too easy, it's too tempting. You gotta you gotta put your foot down. Does it uh, does it cause like a, do you ever have like a problem even with some of the content in the movies that you're riffing? Well, there's a lot of movies I won't do because of it. Um, and, you know, there's certain people I think they'll disagree with me about my choices, but I, I put a lot of thought into it as to why certain movies will work and why I find 
you know, roadhouse acceptable. I, I believe me, I have theories on why what? it is and why others aren't. And uh, you know, as always, people uh, would disagree. But I, I, uh, I have put a lot of thought into it, and, and there's reasons why I do the stuff that I do. Uh, not to get off subject for a moment, but just what is uh, what is with you in Roadhouse? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's just you know I've always found it amusing. It was the thing that I kind of shared with some really good friends when I was uh, younger. A friend of mine was in the first Gulf War, and uh, he it was one of the few movies they had to watch, and he kind of watched it many many times while he was over there. And uh, and it was one that I had seen a few times, probably because it's aired you know 900 times a day on TBS or whatever. Yeah. And so it was just kind of a, a thing where you, you'd see it again, and then he'd bring something up, and I go, "Oh, that's right." And, and you know, it was just a fun thing to share. And so then I I wrote something about it in uh, I wrote a sketch in in uh, Mystery Science, and it kind of took on a, a life of its own, where people really liked this one song that I wrote for it, and. And uh, and over the years, and I wrote a book, and I kind of based on the premise that it's the best bad movie because it's so watchable and it's so earnest, and and the performances are a lot of fun. So it's just kind of I don't know. It's just one of those that I can watch and still smile when I see it after the fiftieth time I've seen it. So do you consider like the Roadhouse riff track? Is that your opus? Well, it's sort of the one that I wanted to, you know, announce that I was serious about this. Like, look, <laughs> I can do Roadhouse, you know, anything's up for, I mean, this is fun. I get to finally uh, take on this film that's been such a, uh, it's been with me in my career for, for better or worse the whole time. Well, I'm going to tell you, I think the the, um, the riff track thing, I mean, the idea, I mean, it was just brilliant. And it's just a natural next step for you. Um, and on a just as far as a personal note from somebody who's watched one, it Pretty easy to to work. <laughs> yeah, that's really good to hear. That was always the big question mark: is how uh, is if this isn't going to work, or if it's difficult, then you know, boy, this is going to be tough. We're going to have to wait till sometime down the road when we solve the technical problems. But we did the first one and just gave it to a whole bunch of people and said, "See if you can make this work." And some were technical and some weren't. And everybody said, "Oh yeah, it worked. Uh, it worked really well." I had to. You know, every now and then, maybe once or maybe twice, I had one got slightly ahead, but it was pretty easy to figure out what that, what it was, and to fix it. So, so yeah, it it does work. Yeah, it it worked. Uh, it worked great for me, and I don't think it ever got more than maybe a second or two ahead at the most. Yeah, that's been our experience, and uh, and you know, we're talking from MP3 players to burning it on CDs to just putting it on your computer to you know all different kinds of devices and ways to do it. There's There's got to be uh, almost limitless possibilities of where you're going to watch one or the other or listen to this, and, and they all seem to work. So, uh, yeah, it's great. Now, uh, going back to what we were talking about a few minutes ago, when we were uh, talking about how your faith influences uh, your work and everything, I'd, I'd heard this about you, and I actually thought this was really interesting, especially considering, you know, what you're known for, Mystery Science Theater and, you know, uh, being you know such a popular television show, it's true. You don't have television in your home. I don't. No. Is is that uh, is that a decision you made because of you know that? <clears throat> yeah, it was uh, kind of my kids uh, mostly. Uh, one thing that really bugged me was my children would be wandering around the kitchen, you know, sort of getting their cereal in the morning, and they're singing these jingles from these annoying like cereal commercials and stuff, and I realized. Wow, you know they they don't know their times tables yet, but they know all of this stuff. So that was <laughs> alarming to me. And then the the other thing was just I was working out one day deep in the winter in Minneapolis, and I used to like to watch stupid TV to make the time go faster. Mm -hmm. And uh, I saw something on just a basic cable show that was so offensive it would knock a buzzard off a gut wagon. You know, <laughs> this is like mm. during the middle of the day, and so I oh, finished my workout and went upstairs and just said, yeah, i got to yank this. This is irresponsible to have this thing in the house. And uh, we as a family, we've never really noticed its its loss at all. I mean, it hasn't been. We still, you know, I have the ability to watch movies, but uh, and, and that means you can watch TV shows, but you get to obviously pick and choose and know exactly what you're watching. Oh, that's that's great. That's a uh, you know commendable because uh, you know there's uh, there's some serious garbage out there. You don't want your kids, you know, 
getting in their heads. And uh, yeah, and and it is like having you know, there's going to be times they're getting older now, and and I think it's even a little more dangerous then that they're going to be seeking out the content that's available, and and when we're not there or whatever, they're good kids, but they're curious and they'll they'll be interested in that. So that's another reason. Like it just seems irresponsible to have that sitting there where anyone can access it. Now you've written several books, and uh, you you I guess you do you currently do you still write for uh, the theater mag the home and theater? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Okay, and then I, I heard you write for Cracked now. Yes, I do. So what are you doing for Cracked? Uh, I've done a few. Uh, so far, I've done two columns for them. They're bi monthly right now, and uh, I've written about. Uh, I think one was about overrated comedies, and another was uh, the worst. Uh, I think it was the worst comedies of all time. Uh, so it's just kind of my my take on the state of comedy uh, usually, but I could go into any number of different directions. Uh, what are some of the worst comedies of all time? Uh, I think I listed uh, Chairman of the Board, which is uh, Carrot Top. Oh wow! That was one that that nearly killed me. Uh, uh, I'm not a big fan of uh, Adam Sandler, so Little Nicky made the list for me. I never saw it. <laughs> uh, thank, thank your luck. <laughs> and uh, and I'm also proud to say I've never seen Chairman of the Board. <laughs> well, that, this speaks well of you, my friend. Well, thank you. <laughs> I don't think this is uh, something to be ashamed of. I was. It, I think I saw these films because I was writing for. Uh, I used to do movie reviews for home theater. Now I just kind of I write on theater topics, but uh, that's why I had to watch these things. Because they had sort of the legitimate reviewers, and then I would take on titles that nobody else wants to do. <laughs> wow. So uh, was chairman of the board, was that your worst on your list? Uh, I can't remember how I placed them in order. Uh, I probably placed Adam Sandler as uh, you know, Little Nicky as one of the worst. That actually brings me to something I wanted to, to get into with you because for the last couple weeks on the show, um, we've been doing one week we, we did a thing on the best movies of all time as compiled by you know us you know, here at the show. Yeah. And we uh, then did the the worst movies of all time. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could give me you know your top few best movies of all time for Mike Nelson and then the worst movies of all time for Mike Nelson. Well, I just saw both of these films again to see if, you know, am I just, do they stand up? And 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 they're pretty, for best, they're pretty uh, mainstream, and that sometimes I think disappoints people. They want to learn about some new gem, but no. Casablanca is just one of my favorite movies. Which is a great movie. Um, it's just, you can watch it again and again, and, and I got to watch it with my niece who'd never seen it before and you know, kind of didn't really know the history of it all and so it was just kind of fun to to uh show her that film and it was just great and um and i really like the uh i'm sorry i'm a geek i like the lord of the rings series i just think it's just so much entertainment uh you know if you like that kind of stuff at all and it's just so well done and it's fun to crank on your home theater <laughs> so, uh and then as far as worst movies there's kind of worst that you know are just boring and and not very well made and then there's just kind of worse that are fun and you know that would be like your roadhouse and your rocky four and stuff like that yeah uh, the day after tomorrow yeah yeah uh but then there's just sort of worse in the in the sense of just you know offensive and you know gross or whatever like uh, i'm not a fan of any kind of horror slasher type movies so so those those would probably make my list if i saw them but um so with that windy introduction in mind, I, I, I don't know. It's, uh, uh, I would have to say something on Mystery Science that we did was probably the worst in terms of, uh, you know, like a Manos, the hands. Well, wow, that was awful. Uh, but, you know, Crossroads, in a fun way, makes a pretty good run at it. Uh, and it is in the bottom 100 on the uh, IMDb L list. Let me ask you, Manos versus Crossroads, which one's more painful? Uh, I think... Oh boy, that is a tough question. It depends That's, on. Uh, I'm a hard hitting here, you know. If you, if you think, <laughs> if you have a special preference either for sort of a a, a man goat with puffy <laughs> versus a sort of giggling girls with inane dialogue, then you know it's it's kind of tough to say. Crossroads might be more punishing to you uh, than. Uh, All right, which one do you think belongs in Gitmo? I think Crossroads. 
Okay. Because it's got, uh, it also has a, it features a Shania Twain song in there. And to me, that's like, you know, just fingernails on a chart. <laughs> Now, I, I appalled my audience because we, we went through our best list, and I had, um, I mean, I had good movies on my list. I had uh, Bridge on the River Kwai, and I had, um, you know, I had High Noon, and I yeah. I had, you know, some, some really good movies, and uh, and then I, I got down to number one, and, and, it, and it was Wayne's World 2. <laughs> no. No, seriously? Wow. Uh, well, I am, I, I'm a Wayne's World 2 apologist. It was better than the first one. You know, you had a, you had a, a great cameo by Charlton Heston. Well, I, I have to confess something here. I, I haven't seen it yet. So, oh, well, you have no clue what you're missing. Well, then I, I, ha- I guess I have to remedy that. Oh, absolutely. No, I mean, you have to go out tonight. All right, I will. Well, you sound serious about that. I mean, I, I don't even know if I can call you a movie expert anymore. <laughs> Almost rendered you speechless. But I, I'm appalled that you wouldn't have seen Wayne's World too. I mean, I, I will remedy this immediately, sir. All right, and, and if you don't do it this weekend, call me and I'll send you a copy. This this has to be this is stat. Okay. Uh, now now you were uh, you were writing a play right based on a movie called The Apple. Right. Uh, what is The Apple and what's the status oh, the, of the play? This is like you not having seen Wayne's World too. I mean, this is. This is uh, the Apple is. Uh, there was a year back. I think it's nineteen. Oh, it's nineteen eighty. Yeah, where they made uh, Xanadu and Can't Stop the Music with uh, the Village People, and then they also, which which uh, which I've seen part of. Yeah, and then uh, they made uh, the Apple, which sort of the completed the. It put a painful period on the end of the horrible disco musical uh, thing, and and the Apple is kind of the. The crown jewel of them all. It's sort was of, this uh, was this the nail in the coffin of disco? Oh, there's no question about it. It, it arrived at spectacularly the, the, the worst time because you know there was a period where suddenly the the air just went out of the whole disco scene, and and the apple came out like that day. You know that the air rushed out, uh, and yeah, it's just it's a bunch of people with glitter on their faces and roller skates and singing a, a pretty horrible musical score. And it's a, sort of a morality tale uh, too, or the, about the uh, music industry. So, uh, so naturally, this is something you wanted to be associated with. Absolutely, if it's uh, painful and uh, it causes people hurt, I want to be involved. Okay. Now, it's, a, it's actually sort of a cult thing in uh, in New York. There's sort of a midnight movie thing where uh, somebody kind of discovered it. it. It really hadn't been seen at all, and then. Uh, People realize, wait, this is a this is a diamond in the rough. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll make a deal with you. I'll go out and get the apple if you get Wayne's World too. Then you come back on and we'll switch reviews. Done and done, my friend. Absolutely. <laughs> so, um, let me think. Oh, okay. I'm uh, I'm sort of uh, I've got like some notes in front of me, and I I sort of was looking at the wrong page. Sure, sure. Uh, because I'm I'm really professional. I, I can I can tell. Oh, well, thank you. Well, I guess you know what I'm going to let you do right now. Do you have any last-minute shameless plugs that you just want to make? I, I don't. You know, I'm so bad at that. I should. People always give me the opportunity, like, hey, what else are you working on? And I just go, I, I don't remember. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know. I, do, I have something. I, I realize. I, uh, uh, one of my uh, series of books with uh, Charles Anderson, uh, the, an art uh, and design firm, and I've done these wacky little uh, collector's books for them. And uh, Fluffy, Humpy, Poopy, Puppy is the name of it. And <laughs> it just just came out, and it's just in stores. And uh, you know, I've heard of I've heard about those books. And uh, w- what exactly are they about? Like, cause... it's it's collections of of sort of bizarre art. Well, it's not bizarre. It's it's well done art, and uh, they're sort of collected by theme. Um, one of them was called uh, Happy Kitty Bunny Pony, and it was, you know, just super cute artwork, usually from the 60s and 70s. And then my commentary uh, running along on it. And uh, they're just great because the, for gift books, because people love to look at them. And then on each page, you know, there's a, a couple of big laughs for you. So uh, they, they kind of are a nice gift. Pretty cool. And where can you get them at? 
those should be at most bookstores. They're they're surprisingly of all my books, they're the ones that you're most likely to find in the front of the bookstore. Really? On a table because they're so fun to pick up and, and look through. Easier to find than Death Rat? Uh, they are, yeah. My my other, you know, when you write humor books, they're usually buried next to the janitor's closet on <laughs> the stairs. So, yeah, this is this is one that would probably be out front. No kidding. Yeah. I, I'm impressed. Yeah. Hey, can I uh, can I ask you to do me a, a favor? Uh, sure. Does it involve Wayne's World 2? Well, that's another favorite I'll ask you about in a few okay, minutes. Okay, all right. All right. <laughs> Maybe you could riff Wayne's World 2 just for me. Ah, that's not a bad idea. <laughs> Is can you now can you do me a promo for the show? Yes, because that would be like that would be tops. All right, and it's in case you've forgotten already. I don't blame you if you have. It's the Joe Cook program. I would have said show probably. Most people would have, but I, I, I'm I'm little you know long winded that way. I got to go with the two syllables. I like it better. It actually has a much classier sound. Well, thank you. Okay, you ready? Go for it. Hey, this is Michael J. Nelson of Legend Films and Riff Tracks, and I also make a a pretty mean quesadilla. And you are listening to the Joe Cook program, and God bless you for doing so. Why, thank you very much. My pleasure. Now, I'm going to hold you to that Wayne's World 2 thing. Okay, that's uh, I will. I will check it out. Uh, it, honestly, absolutely. If you want, I'll send you a copy of it this week. I can get it. I got the Netflix thing. I'll put it in my queue right now. All right. Uh, that'll be uh, honestly. W- would you mind coming back on after you see it? Yeah, I'll I'll do it. Oh, that would be great. And I will watch the Apple. Okay, sweet. Now they have that on Netflix. Yeah, it's actually it, um, amazingly. There's a DVD of it that's a really good transfer and everything. So you know when you, how you're watching a bad film, at least you don't have to suffer through like a really bad print. Well, like Legends version of Plan Nine. That was beautiful. Yeah. There you go. Oh. Well, I'm going to pick up the Apple, you pick up Wayne's World 2, and you have an open invitation back on as soon as you see it. All right, thanks a lot. All right, thanks a lot, Mike. It was was a lot of fun. It was fun. Take care. Take care. Have a good day.